The Ninth Step of William Beebe, A Cautionary Tale, by Jerry F. William Beebe, a real estate agent and massage therapist in Las Vegas, was in and out of alcohol rehab centers in the early 90s. In 1993, he came into AA, where he got sober and stayed that way. In September 2005, Beebe wrote a letter to Liz Socorro in which he acknowledged his guilt and shame at having raped her. Sakuro, then age 39 and living in Connecticut, says she didn't even need to open it when she saw Beeb's name on the envelope. She guessed that it must be an apology for a sexual encounter that had occurred in 1984 during a fraternity party when she and Beeb were attending the University of Virginia. There were a number of email exchanges between the two, and Beeb expressed remorse in all of them. However, he usually blamed his action on his alcoholism, so that Sakuro felt Beeb was apologizing, but at the same time excusing his actions. In some of the emails, Sakuro expressed her outrage at Beeb for the rape, while other emails were not exactly friendly, but certainly less bitter and accusative. In early December, Liz Sakuro called the Charlottesville, Virginia Police Department. She told the chief about the rape and about having reported it to the university deans and the university police at the time it occurred. She explained about the emails she was now getting and how she felt she might now need protection. When the Charlottesville Police Department met with officials of the University of Virginia, they received different versions of the event. They were told that the university investigated the allegations thoroughly and that the final decision to press charges was left up to the student, Sakuro, and that she declined to do so. Police were also informed that William Beebe met with the Dean of Students a few days following the accusation and that Beebe then resigned. As for the crime itself, Sakuro remembers very little. She was drunk at the frat house and passed out several times. She has a vague recollection of being led upstairs into a bedroom. Beeb says that the sexual act was very brief, with neither one of them removing any clothing. In January 2006, Beeb was charged with rape and object sexual penetration and faced life in prison if convicted. After his arrest, he claimed that the sex was consensual. However, in one of the many emails, Beeb wrote, quote, I want to make clear that I am not intentionally minimizing the fact of having raped you. I did. And I understand how our now differing accounts have evoked an angry conflict within you. It seems, no matter what I say, you are dissatisfied that I am all about the business of accountability and taking full responsibility as I can for having raped you. End quote. The prosecution argued that, as bad as the original offense had been, Beeb's apology was selfish and that it had traumatized Sakuro all over again. Sakuro testified that Beeb's decision to contact her caused her to have two miscarriages and frequent panic attacks. She also endured harsh criticism from people who disagreed with her decision to press charges. In November 2006, Beeb took a plea deal after investigators determined that Sakura was sexually attacked by more than one person on the night in question. Sakura had written to Beeb that she felt there was more than one attacker. Was it true? Beeb replied that he was the only rapist but it was Beeb's defense team that uncovered the two other assailants. In March 2007, Beeb was sentenced to 18 months in prison and 500 hours of community service related to sexual assault and alcohol abuse on college campuses. A seven-and-a-half-year prison sentence was suspended, provided that Beeb performed his community service. The Charlottesville judge that imposed the sentence seemed torn between the horrific act 
that Beeb had performed and the fact that Beeb had gone on to be a leader in the recovery community. Phoebe Fliakos, a Charlottesville trauma and substance abuse counselor, said, This is really complex territory. Making amends for a felony that can carry jail time seems to me to be outside the scope of AA. He should have been getting outside counsel, and if he relied on just one rape victim for advice, he may not have understood the profound effect his reentry into Sakura's life could have. Beeb had previously stated that he had sought counsel from his AA sponsor. At least ten character witnesses testified in court that Beeb was a good man and that he had helped many of them overcome their addictions. Beeb had been sober for 13 years at that time. Beeb was released after serving only five months of his sentence. Sakuro was appalled that his punishment was so light, but she has more resentment for the University of Virginia and the way they handled the affair than she does for Beeb. The investigation into her rape remains open as evidence suggests that two more men may have been involved. That is, two men may have raped Sakuro that night before Beeb did so. Beeb's first sponsor advised Beeb against approaching Sakuro. Beeb spoke with various other AA members for several years, and they too discouraged Beeb from making contact with Sakuro. Beeb's first sponsor relapsed and told Beeb that he had done so as a result of having performed an inadequate eighth and ninth step. Beeb's new sponsor encouraged Beeb to find Sakuro and make amends. The Beeb Sakuro case made national news, receiving coverage from the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the Fix, the Huffington Post, the Boston Globe, NBC News, the Daily Beast, USA Today, and People Magazine. Sakuro went on to write a book which describes the crime, the communications with Beeb, and the trial. She is highly critical of the University of Virginia, and she has been a guest speaker at numerous events. Consider the fate of Jamie Kellum Letson, who confessed that she killed her college friend with two bullets to the head 30 years earlier. Letson's sponsor guided her to write a letter to her dead friend and then drove her to the cemetery to read it. That was before the sponsor turned her in and used the letter as evidence. Or Bob Ryder's AA confession that he had a dead body in his basement that was starting to smell. His sponsor suggested pouring baking soda on the decomposing woman before turning him into the authorities two weeks later. And such confessions of guilt are not limited to the hallowed halls of AA. Back in 1998, more than 200 members of the online support group Moderation Management were witness to the online drunken confession of Larry Freusted, who admitted to being wickedly drunk purposely setting his house on fire and killing his five-year-old daughter, Amanda. Of the 200, only three reported the confession to police. Freusted was later arrested and convicted of his crime. Crimes committed while drinking and drugging are still crimes, not merely collateral damage from a substance-abusing past. And that may be where the confusion lies for the newly sober. Many experts suggest caution and discretion before disclosing information in an AA meeting or to a sponsor. Theoretically, everything that is said in an AA meeting is supposed to be kept confidential by all the other attendees, so there would have to be a breach of the AA code if law enforcement is contacted to report a confession, says Carol Lieberman, M.D., Beverly Hills forensic psychiatrist. Nonetheless, if an alcoholic patient of mine who was attending AA meetings asked if he should confess to a crime at an AA meeting, I would certainly counsel him against it. Additionally, Lieberman says she would explore with her patient 
why he wanted to do so. Was he feeling guilty about his crime and trying to sabotage himself so that someone would report it and he would be punished? She says, obviously, this would be a self-destructive means of repenting or making amends. If he committed a serious crime and wanted to turn himself in, then the best way to do so would be to contact law enforcement in the company of one's attorney. Especially in an era of social media and cell phones, caution is advised when discussing things with participants, according to Samshaz Clark. Sometimes, someone can almost be tricked into disclosing, and you don't know the motives of your sponsor, he says. There is no ethical surveillance. You need to give pause before disclosing. The problem for the newly sober is poor cognitive discernment, and according to Dix New York LCSW Richard Buckman, who has been in recovery for many years, what happens in early recovery is that you say things you shouldn't say, he says. That's why sponsorship is encouraged. According to Buckman, when someone confesses to a crime, members of the group could help them see how to do the right thing. I know stories of people who have gotten sober and, in an effort to live life fully, they turn themselves into authorities. So how do 12-step groups build trust under the shadow of possible arrest after a Step 5 confession? A huge component is trust and feeling safe talking about what they have done, says Faye S. Taxman, Ph.D., a university professor in the Criminology, Law, and Society Department at George Mason University and director of the Center for Advancing Correctional Excellence at the Washington, D.C. University. If it results in negative consequences, they will feel suspicious. If arrests become more prevalent, it undermines communities for self-help. AA was founded on spiritual principles of anonymity and disclosure. Interestingly, however, AA literature defines anonymity at the personal level. Anonymity provides protection for all members from identification as alcoholics. The Understanding Anonymity pamphlet never mentions safety from disclosure of a crime. Beeb is a cautionary tale. Did he do the right thing on his ninth step? Was it right for him and for Liz Sakuro? Was society well served? And finally, as a sponsor, would you and should you advise your sponsee to do as Beeb did? Beeb didn't out himself by accident. He shopped for a sponsor that would advise him to contact Sakuro. Neither the sponsor nor Beeb seemed to have given any thought to how devastating this would be to Sakuro. Sakuro suffered because of the rape and again through the letters and emails sent to her by Beeb and again at the trial of Beeb. And this being America, Sakuro wrote a book that sold well and she's been on talk shows and the speaker circuit for years. When last heard from, William Beeb was living in Chesterfield, Virginia. He is no longer on parole. He's a registered sex offender and is unemployed. About the author, Jerry F. Jerry F. is one of the founding members of We Agnostics in Tempe, Arizona, and was the instigator of the WAFT Arizona Convention last November in Phoenix. He has served in many positions in his 27 years in AA and is currently treasurer of his traditional AA group coffee maker of his secular group and is beginning a term as a board member of Waftiak. He considers his greatest achievement as being responsible for a change to the fourth edition of the big book and his greatest asset as being relentlessly anal. The original print version of this article, The Ninth Step of William Beebe, A Cautionary Tale by Jerry F., may be found on the website aabeyondbelief.com in the Steps and Traditions section, dated April 10, 2016. This audio presentation was recorded on February 9, 2017. 
For more stories, articles, and podcasts, please visit our YouTube or SoundCloud channels. Just search for AA 